Hi, Nina Jones Cox here. I uh, thought I'd do a little intro to the video that you're about to watch or not watch. I wanted to make sure you knew what you were getting into because it's, it's a solid hour long commitment if you watch the whole thing. And just wanted to make sure that you were uh, making good use of your time here on social media. Uh, this is a Zoom call that I did with one of our members who came to an exchange meeting that we hold every single week. It's a, called a Haves and Wants meeting. And she came with a deal to be funded and she didn't get an offer to fund the deal. She got five very, very different offers to fund the deal. And she came away going, well, I, I know the money's there somewhere, but I'm not sure which of these offers is the right one for me to take. So I agreed to... Uh, put it on a spreadsheet, talk to her for an hour about the pros and cons of accepting each deal, what they each did. So, I mean, we geek out pretty hard on creative deal structuring in this video. If you're not into that, then you probably want to move on and find something else. But if you are into it or you would like to be, I think you're going to find it a, a good use of your time because it's way more in depth than the discussions you usually hear about creative deal structuring, partnerships, hard money loans, private loans, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, so I hope you enjoy it. Uh, let me know and in the comments. And also if there's any other sort of, boy, I would really like to see somebody doing this that we can produce for you for content, definitely let me know. Enjoy. On last week's prop swap call, the Kori Ria prop swap call. Um, we had a, we had a, a busy morning and some deals got funded and some things got swapped. But one of the things that happened was Lenora here had a duplex in Columbus that she offered up for sale. Now this was after weeks of her saying, I want to keep it. I want to rent it. And then all of a sudden she offered it up for sale. So the question came up, why are you selling it? And she said, well, because I need $75,000 to fix it. I already closed it. I've got a bunch of my cash in there. I can't, I can't seem to get $75,000. So I figure I'll just sell it and be done with it. And that of course generated a lot of uh, offers to help her finance those repairs because a big a big part of the reason for a for the for the prop swap meetings and the haves and wants meetings is not just to make deals it's to solve problems in ways that are profitable to everybody. So the problem was she didn't get like one simple I'll loan you the money at X percent interest. She actually got four completely separate offers <laughs> plus a variation on one of the offers. So afterwards I texted her and I said, well, the good news is, you know, you got the money. The bad news is I bet you're overwhelmed by the very different offers you got to finance it. And would you like to go through uh, sort of the pros and cons and meanings and outcomes of each one? And is it okay if I record it because there were 71 other people on that call that I'm thinking we're having the same question, like which one should she accept? Which one is best? And the the issue, of course, is with two exceptions that came from Pete Fortunato, so are of course like so far out of the box they can't see the box anymore. The the two offers she she got that were more um, along the lines of a standardish offer. Uh, have very different outcomes in terms of her ownership of the property and her cash flow on the property. So what we're going to do is along with Lenora, we are going to kind of walk through the meanings of each of these and how they look financially. But ultimately, she may she may choose none of them. She may choose one you didn't expect because it is so uh, the, the the kind of deal you want to structure is so dependent on sort of your own preferences about things like, do you like cash flow better? Or do you like equity better? Do you like uh, complete control of the, of the property better? Or do you like cheaper payments better? So uh, I set, sort of set up a spreadsheet here and I'm hoping everybody's seeing the spreadsheet now. Are you, did the spreadsheet come up on the screen, Lenora? Yes. Okay. Yep. Um, I set up a, a spreadsheet here and I, I do these all the time for my own offers, by the way, this is like when I'm 
considering a similar sort of thing, I do a spreadsheet because I need to see them side, side by side and really think through what the outcomes of each one are. So the after repaired value is 240. Uh, that's Lenore's, Lenore's number. She paid 88 for it and she paid cash. So she's got $88,000 stuck in that property right now. She needs $75,000 to complete the work and hold it for rental, which is her ideal goal. It is a duplex with two, three bedroom, two bath apartments, right? Um, two, three bedroom. Uh, one is one and a half bath and one is one bath. Okay. So a one and a one and a half. And she believes that each side will rent for $1,100. We're going to put in a factor here of 30%, which is for maintenance, vacancy, and capital expenditures. So that's my experience is, is uh, two families because generally they require a little more maintenance from the owner than a single family because there's just things in a single family the tenant mows the lawn full stop. Like that's just part of their job in a duplex. Somebody has to mow the lawn and normally you either pay somebody to do that. Or if one of the tenants is doing it, it's in return for some sort of a rent reduction or something like that. So uh, for, on a single family, I would have used 20%. I'm going to use 30% on this. Uh, there's, there's some cleaning of the common areas that happens in a duplex that you don't really see in a single family. So this covers just the day-to-day -day maintenance once it is renovated, which that's what we're trying to get the money for is to renovate it. It covers vacancy loss. And then this CapEx is the when it needs a new roof, which might be 15 years from now, the reserves need to pay for the roof. You, you need to not be spending that money and not have the money for the roof. when it. And the same thing with the furnace, the windows, the kitchens, the water heater, you know, everything that can, that, that is slowly going bad about the property. That's re, that's partly reserves for that. We just went to the uh, Franklin County auditor site and figured out that because there is some sort of a, it's not a tax abatement on this property. It's something going on in this neighborhood where they have just mm -hmm. basically said, we're lowering all the taxes by 2% to encourage people to live here or something that next year the taxes are likely to be 118 a month based on her purchase price um we're guesstimating the insurance at 120 a month right now it's it's got a vacant property policy which is much more expensive but we think it'll be around 120 and of course these numbers in the spreadsheet can be updated as we get actual real numbers but that makes what's called the net operating income on the property, $1,301.83 a month. So the NOI is a mm, little bit, a little bit more than half of the gross rent, which is a, that's pretty, that's a pretty typical outcome is that when you really dig down into what's the net operating income, it's, it's 50, 55, 60% of the gross rent. Now you notice here that there is a refi prediction because at some point Lenore is going to want to get that eighty-eight thousand dollars out of that property and go spend it on another property or maybe go on a really great vacation. I don't know what she'll do with the money, uh, but several of these offers were such that even if she didn't want to unlock the, her money, she would need to refinance it in order to take the other person out of the deal. So we're working on the basis that she can get a cash out refi at 70% of the loan to value in one year. 70% of a $240,000 appraisal, we're sort of assuming the value is not going to go up over the course of this year because the market has softened up. So we are mm -hmm. assuming she can still get an appraisal for 240, but it won't be more than that. And this was a complete wild guess. <laughs> what what will the interest rate be in a year? Um, we're saying 8%. Uh, the good thing about the spreadsheet is if it looks like it's going to be more like 9%, we can just make that change there and that will change the payment. It'll correct the payment to what it would be at a 9% interest rate. But we're going to say 8% interest rate. And who knows, maybe it's lower, maybe it's higher. We don't know. So the first issue I saw here was that with this net operating income, 
1301. And this monthly principal and interest payment on a 168 loan at 8% for 360 months, the cash flow is very, very low. It's about $69 a month. And that is that is just the effect that higher interest rates have. If this was if if we could um, refinance it a year ago <laughs> instead of a year from now, the interest rate would have been well to be an investor interest rate, not a homeowner interest rate. So you know it might have been four point five percent, and yeah, that would have created a payment. Of, yeah, that would have created a payment of eight fifty one, which would have been four fifty a month in net cash flow, which is sweet. But that's not where we are in the market right now. So. Oh boy. <laughs> Well, see, people people ask, you know, how's the how are house prices going to go down when there's still a shortage of housing? And that's your answer right there. People are you can't afford it. Anything. Nope. This this house, if interest rates go up to 12%, the house literally becomes worth less money to the next buyer because this would be a seriously negative number if the interest rates were at 12%. Now, I, I would also be working a lot more in that house. Yeah. <laughs> So the cost of the, I, I just basically said, when you refinance a house, even conventionally, the appraisal, the application fee, a couple of points, points, all the junk fees, um, usually end up being about 5% of the amount borrowed. So this is an expense of getting the loan that you never get back. And it's about, eight, I figured it was about $8,400 on this loan. So let's go back and look at the prop swap sheet again. If you've never been to one of our meetings, this probably looks super confusing, but everything that's happening here is the person who was made the offer is in yellow. And then the people making the offers are in green. And so this is actually a bunch of different offers that were made and answered, but Lenora's first offer came from me. And the offer was, I will have $75,000 in a week or two that is coming from a 1031 exchange. I, I'm selling a property. I'm exchanging all the money into, into other properties. And I'm doing that, of course, to avoid the capital gains, to not avoid it, because um, eventually that catches up with you. But for right now, uh, avoiding the capital gains tax but in order to do that, in order to exchange into a piece of a property, it has to be property. I can't take the money and give her a loan because that won't satisfy the terms of the exchange. So offer number one was Vina will provide $75,000. Vina will be buying 50% of the property for that $75,000. So I, I won't own the whole property. I'll own half of it if, if this was the accepted offer. Lenora expressed that she has not done a lot with partners and she expressed not directly, but you could sort of see it in her face. Um, some concern about like giving up half the control of the property forever and ever and ever. So I said, I would give you an option to buy my half back, but you couldn't do that for 13 months because I have to leave the money there for at least 12 months. Two years is actually better. And if she were to do that, if she were to exercise that option and buy back my 50% in 13 months, then I would have to take that money and go find yet another property to exchange it into. So the way I sort of laid this out for you, Lenora, was to look at what you are giving up and what you are getting from each offer. And in this particular case, you have already given up 90, not $95,000 cash, $88,000 cash. Let's get that fixed. Because you already bought the property. Yes. Now, what you will be getting is $75,000 to finish your repairs and half of the ownership of the property. So half of the ownership of the property means you're giving away 50% of the cash flow 
So I just, I took this net operating income number, I multiplied it by 12 and then divided it by two. So you would be getting 7811 in cash flow, but you would be giving up 7811 in cash flow because that would be my half of the cash flow. Based on the investment you've already made, the 7811 you'll be getting is about an 8.9% cash on cash return. You put in 95 or 88, you're getting back 7811. That's about an 8.9% cash on cash return. And that would be your true cash on cash return for that first year. Because when you have a partner, as opposed to a loan, you don't owe the partner any money if the property isn't making any money. So there's no payment that like, well, the whole thing's going to be vacant for the next three months because it's under rehab, but I still owe a payment every month. There's no payment every month because as long as it's not making money, neither one of us makes any money. Now, going over here to what does Vina give up and what does Vina get? Vina gives up $75,000 in cash from this exchange, gets 50% of the equity, that makes the cash flow for Vina the same as it is for Lenora, 50-50, which gives Vina a rate of return of 10.4%. Now you express some consternation about that as well. Like I have more money in it. And also I am going to be doing all the work. I'm going to be doing the management. I'm going to be doing the rehab, all of that sort of stuff. Your rate of return is higher than mine if we're 50-50 partners and you put in less money than I did. That is correct. I would like to point out, though, that you have the ability to deal be in this deal forever, and I am out of control of that because of your option. If you were willing to say, I don't need an option, leave your money in forever, I would... I would be well, or, you know, we could still refinance. If we were partners, we could still refinance it and take our cash out, but I wouldn't want to not be your partner after that. Mm -hmm. um, then I would be willing to adjust the ownership ratios so that they were, so that we were getting the same return. You'd have more ownership. I'd have a little less ownership so that we were getting the same rate of return. But given that my expectation would be that in a year, you're going to be calling me up going, okay, I found a loan. I'm going to be buying you out of this deal. And now I have to go back and find another one that I like just as well, find it in 45 days, you know, do all that stuff that a 1031 exchange requires. So you're following this so far, right, Lenora? I am. Mm -hmm. right. I'm, I'm dealing with my calculator. That's what I'm looking at. <laughs> okay. So in 13 months, should you decide that you wanted to um, go ahead and refinance it. You're going to have, you're going to be putting in about $8,400 just in the costs of the loan. Cause if you're refining me out of it, I am not paying any of your loan costs. <laughs> if you're taking it away from me, it's not my loan cost to pay. And then uh, this number came out wrong. Which this should have been a yeah, and then in the buyout again because you are buying me out and I'm I have to go find something else and if I don't find anything else I have to pay, pay the taxes on everything. I put in the number that your option to buy buy back from me would be for eighty. So I put in seventy five. My half is actually worth more than seventy five right? There's like more equity there than there's 120,000 in equity. And in theory, I own half that equity, but I would be willing to give up my $120,000 equity for 80 if it was done within 13 to 16 months, call it. So you will need cash to buy me out. And that means that your, your total cash invested in this loan is $13,400. Actually, you know what? This number was right before because I just realized how I figured this out. Would flexible terms for the buyout be favorable to you? I can't do that because if I, if I were no, no, to... For, 
in, in, on your end, you say you're saying that, you know, if you can't find a place, you have to pay taxes on your money. So, yes. And I know exactly what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, instead okay. of me giving you eighty thousand dollars, why don't you just finance eighty thousand dollars to me at some payment we both like, right? No, 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 no. I'm saying um, flexible terms when 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 it's time for me to buy you out. Like instead of me saying this is the day I'm buying you out, go find something else. Mm-hmm. It is this is the day I'm wanting to start. You know that process. Yeah, I would, I would definitely in the option, I would definitely have like, you need to give me 60 days notice okay, so, so that I can go try finding something else. Okay. And hopefully the market's a lot softer next year. I'm, I thought that's a strange thing to say. Hopefully the market is uh, like worse next year, but I mean, really, if I you're buying, <laughs> we are buyers. We- <laughs> That's, that's what that's what you want. 2006, I would be very mad at seeing this conversation mm-hmm. <laughs> from what mm-hmm. happened to me. <laughs> so the reason I said you would need two thousand more dollars to buy me out is because remember we said it would appraise for two forty. You could borrow one sixty eight to pay back ninety five plus or sorry eighty eight which is what you put in it, plus another 80, you're, you're actually, you're actually coming out a little short on the cash out refi. So, I mean, it's not, it's not literally that you would bring $2,000 to the closing to buy me out because what what would happen is you just leave $2,000 of your money in it. Mm -hmm. But the total cash that you would have invested in the deal when that was over would only be 10-4. That includes the rents and everything. No, that that just that's just like we're at the end of the refi. How much okay. money does Lenora still have in this deal? And instead of it being eighty eight thousand, which I don't know why I you saw me correct that. I did. I don't know what happened. How it went back to. I don't either. You know what? I should actually reference the right way to do this is reference the front sheet so that if we. Okay. So 88,000. And for some reason that changed this number to 181,000 and it shouldn't have. So what this is, is we've got 168. We're going to subtract from that what you paid, because that's the part of what you're trying to get out of this. And then we're going to subtract from that my buyout. Oh, you came out at exactly the right number. There's no more 80, 88 plus 80 is 168. And that's exactly how much you can refi for. So (laughs) now, so now you're at, didn't do that on purpose. It just, that's how it came out. So, so you'll leave 8,400 bucks in it because of the money you had to bring to actually do the refi. Okay. So the problem, as we mentioned before, is at 8% interest, this thing cash flow is 69 bucks a month. But the good news is you only have 8,400 invested. So that's a 9.9% return <laughs> on your investment. So that's good. Still winning ish. <laughs> <laughs> now that, um, now, it, you know, we don't know what's going to happen to rents. Will they go, will they go up? Will they go down? And the, the key thing here is you like this neighborhood. You like this house. You said someone asked you how long you plan to keep it. And you're like, well, uh, at least until I retire, <laughs> which to me sounded like the rest of my life or until somebody wants to give me something I like better than this house for it. Mm-hmm. So what does Vina give up in this refi? Well, all the ownership has to find a new property to exchange into, but she gets eight thousand dollars and the other thing she gets and this is the kind of little detail that people forget about until the bitter end or they forget about it altogether half of these reserves that you've been keeping actually belong to me Mm -hmm. because i gave it up out of my half of the rent Mm -hmm. so at closing i would be entitled to get half of those reserves that had been set aside and it's possible some of them have been spent by then but whatever whatever that number is yeah, whatever has been withheld from our income 
because it was for reserves, I would get it back at that point. Okay. So even if it was spent, you're not, no, no, no. If it was spent, I mean, there'll be an accounting, you know, we put aside, you know, every month we put aside 660 bucks, but in month three, the water heater went bad. Okay. And so that, that sucked a thousand dollars out of that $1,800 reserve account that left 800, but then we put more in. So no, you don't have to like pay. For, we don't pay for the water heater. And then also I get back the money that went into reserve because that got spent. Okay. So, so one of the things about partnerships is that somebody's got to be doing kind of a detailed accounting different than what you would do if you own the property all by yourself. Because mm-hmm. I've had partnerships blow up over show me where the reserve account went, for instance. Well, I, you know, I, I spent it on this, this, and that. No, no, show me, show it to me in QuickBooks. Show it to me and <laughs> don't just tell me you did it. You know, the, the, Quick, the QuickBooks would have invoice numbers for the, re, for the replacement of the water heater. And they, they kind of fall apart over that kind of little, we're only talking about $400 here, <laughs> but, but, it but it, it, whole... I mean, it, I feel like it's bigger than 400 though, because if you, if you can't account for the 400, then what else aren't you accounting for? And that's exactly the thought the partner has. Mm-hmm. Oh, she's so disorganized. She doesn't keep track of things. I wonder what else she mm-hmm. didn't keep track of. Am I getting, so usually when I do my partnerships and I'm, I was actually discussing another partnership that came out of uh, prop swap about two months ago. And it's also in Columbus. It's also a deal where uh, the the dude in Columbus is obviously doing the rehab and the management because I'm not there. I'm here. And I said, you know, why don't we handle the money this way? I'll open up a bank account. I have a full-time CPA who works for me, who manages these bank accounts and the invoices and the payouts. And because this one involves assuming a loan. So that has to be paid every month, right? You can't, you don't want to get that call. Nope. And she is way more organized than I am. And she's way more organized than this guy is. So I said, why don't we just wait? Well, the rents come into this account. She'll pay out the the mortgages, taxes, insurance. If you have a, if you spent money and you have an invoice, send it in, she'll send you the money. And then every quarter, when we get our distributions, it will say exactly where the money came from and went to. And that, that just, it makes me comfortable that somebody who doesn't have the organization. Well, she, she doesn't have any reason to move money from one side to the other, right? She's not getting, she, she does isn't directly she doesn't have a direct interest in the property. Mm-hmm. So it like, she, she doesn't care if he gets 200 more and I get 200 less. Her job is just to make sure it all balances. Mm-hmm. So. And so to be clear, the reason that I was given, uh, I wanted to back up the reason that I was um, wanting to sell the property is because I lost financing on the day of close mm-hmm. and got, you know, it I was, was all ready. arranged and then it, it wasn't, it wasn't. And that happened. That was my first. That was my first time <laughs> trusting yep. the process of something that I don't typically use. And mm-hmm. it, on the day of, though, everything was great and perfect until the day. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's and that's why you always have you always have a community that you can go to and say, "Help! I got this emergency thing." and you know, that's why it's, that's why it's so good to be a member of Kori and Rhea and that, and like be connected to the group, right? You can't just show up out of the blue. I haven't been to a meeting. Like, hey, I'm new. <laughs> the last two hours I've been listening to y'all. Give me some money. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, new is fine. Like if you bring a good deal as a new investor, somebody's going to want to fund it, but you can't just like, you can't just show up when you need something. You have to be offering stuff. Mm-hmm yourself. And, and I, I, early on, particularly in the prop swap, um, you just offered people a lot of advice on where to get cheap appliances and how to use home warranties to protect your oh, yeah. properties. I mean, there was a, there was a lot of people know you because you just sort of gave them advice as they, as you could, and as they needed it. Thank so, you. and I was going to ask you about that, about the home warranty. I literally was about <laughs> to ask you about that. You know, 
because that is a pivotal part of keeping our money to me, because, you know, the home warranty is say $600 a year plus a hundred dollars per service call where they either fix or replace whatever is wrong. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that is a lot cheaper than buying hot water tanks and, you know, um, uh, fixing wires or, you know, plumbing issues. Well, so what we would do is we would go over here and you said it was 600 a year. Yeah. So it's like 50 bucks a month effectively. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Each side would be like, I would say each side would be about $30, 25 to $30 a month. All right. Let's, let's go on the high end there and say it's 60 bucks a month. Mm -hmm. Uh, We'll just add that in as an operating expense, but what that might do, and we, we would have to talk this through offline is it might reduce the reserves needed for vacancy maintenance and CapEx. I feel like it offsets the maintenance. Okay. Right. Because I mean, the one that I get even covers uh, leak uh, roof leaks. (laughs) Okay. So, (laughs) so, so so maybe there, I mean, there's still the, there's still the lawn mowing and the cleaning the basement and the, all that stuff, but maybe that reduces the maintenance and CapEx uh, to 25%. Okay. Yeah, I believe that that would be fair. We can just we can just play play with these numbers however we want because it'll it'll just if it will actually type like it's supposed to. Okay, okay. so so with that change we made, the new cash flow after you refi the property goes up a hundred bucks a month because we reduce the maintenance vacancy capex and I that's fair to say because i mean i don't pay i i've had properties for years and i haven't paid for hardly anything mm-hmm. i mean they've paid me <laughs> yeah so so your your uh your rate of return while the deal is still has both of our cash stuck in it is 9.217 the rate of return after the refi is 17 percent because at that point you only have 8400 in the property okay your, your investment has been greatly reduced now i will say that if instead of taking me out of the deal you wanted to you wanted us to refi the property and both stay in the deal the amount you know obviously you wouldn't have to give me 80,000 to get out of the deal cuz I'm uh, not getting out of the deal that would that would make me happier just because I wouldn't have to find a new property to exchange into and the uh rate of return I would split this with you I would split this cost of refi with you and it would make both of our rate of returns go up so Vina gets 80,000 she this is assuming a 13 month refi she gets half of her reserves back and she gets a financial friendship with Lenora. Uh, Lenora gets the money for, from this whole deal. She gets the money right now within within a week or two to keep the property, get it into shape and so on. And she also gets a financial friend relationship with Vina. Now, the other thing, the other thing about this higher rate of return is I wouldn't expect this property to be fully in service for three or four months. So this is only the rate of return when it's fully in service. When it's not in service, the rate of return is zero Okay. on the property. So that was offer number one. Now, offer number two, which... I do, I do have a question about offer number one. Mm-hmm. At the end of the year, once the year is up, mm-hmm. what was the total amount of what you would be getting from that deal? I get $80,000, which... Well, no, I mean like um, the excess of... uh, I mean the excess of like, you know, there's the 5,000, then Mm -hmm. there's the... 3,300. 3,300. Which is a guess about what the reserves are going to be. It's whatever, half of whatever is in the reserve account. Okay. So here, what is that actual total for... It's eighty. Help, it's eighty. My brain. Eighty-three, three, but seventy-five of that is return of my investment. Yeah, everything minus your return of your investment. What is that number? Uh, it is eighty-three hundred dollars. 
Okay. And that's with the rent rates. That's just a, that's just a snapshot. That's at the closing. What does it say? Vina's getting paid out on the closing statement. And per month you're getting what? Per month, I'm getting half the cash flow, which is half of 1351 once the property is up and running. Okay. So I would count that as like eight months of, so that's. Yeah. So the rate, the rate of return, it, I can just change this number and say, instead of okay. it being uh 12 months worth of rent, it's eight months worth of rent. Mm-hmm. So that's a 7.21% rate of return because of the four months of effectively complete vacancy. Okay, that's what I needed. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna put that that's, back. It'll make me it'll make it easier for me to do the comparison between mm-hmm. you and Darren. Well now, yeah, now don't uh don't I I put what Vina gets and what Vina gives up here as a matter of explaining to you and everyone else why I would want to be in the deal. It's a big mm-hmm. mistake when looking at different deal structures to say, what is the other person getting as opposed to what am I getting? Okay. It's just like, it's just like when you wholesale a property and somebody's like super happy to pay you a hundred thousand dollars for it. And then they find out that you're making 20 and then they're upset, right? Oh, how, yeah. how, how, no, come, no. how come it was worth a hundred a minute ago? And now, now, you know, now that, you know, I'm making 20, you're like, you're ripping me off. So my brain thinks differently. My last wholesale deal, the guy made 30,000. Mm-hmm. I could care less. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I am very happy with that deal till this day. You know, all of my wholesale deals, I know what the amount is before I even close. So my brain just needed this number for a different reason. Okay. So the second the second offer, and this was actually the last offer, but I'm just going to do them in the order that makes sense, was an attempt to solve, not solve, but address your issue about why is your half bigger than my half? Why is your rate of return bigger than my rate of return? And Pete Fortunato suggested that instead of changing the ownership percentages that what we do was you have put in your 88. I have put in my 75. We are 50, 50 owners, but that 50, 50 partnership then leases the property to you at a set monthly payment. So, so that you're basically taking more of the cash flow, and the number that was initially put out there was the partnership leases it to you for 600, which means you get 300 of that 600. It's kind of, it's kind of hard to get your brain around because just think of the partnership as a separate entity. So there's me, there's you, there's us. And we're talking about us here. Okay. Mm -hmm. So us get split in half us leases the property to you for the original thing was 600 a month. And that means that of that 600 a month, you get 300 and I get 300. So Mm -hmm. effectively it increases your cash flow both by fixing the amount of money you're going to pay every month, but also of giving you all the remaining cash flow over 600 a month and also 300 Mm -hmm. (laughs) from the from the pay- payment that's being made. Now I, I did a quick calculation on my calculator and I said 600, so me getting 300 a month is a terrible rate of return on my $75,000. It's 6,000 a year on 75,000. So I said, I, I might consider a thousand a month and that is what this represents. So, okay. so the offer two is Vina puts up 75,000. Vina owns 50% of the property, but Vina and Lenora will give Lenora 
a master lease, which means you're leasing the whole property from the partnership at a thousand dollar a month cost. So I added back in here an option to buy, but the option to buy needs to be at a higher price if I'm giving up some of the cash flow in the meantime. So you've still given up your $95,000 cash. dollars $88,000 cash. Yep, I need to just grab that from... Once you make a mistake in an Excel spreadsheet, <laughs> it's, it's it changes, you know, it, it the, the, you have to go find all the places where you made the same mistake. <laughs> so you're giving up a thousand dollars a month in cash flow, but you are getting because the the net operating income is 1351. So you are getting. 1351 minus 1000 cuz you owe that to the partnership but plus 500 because you get 500 of that 1000 <laughs> so now your rate of return you're you're getting uh $851 a month in cash flow so your rate of return Wait, is that per year? Yes, that uh, that's that's per month. So we need to multiply this whole thing by twelve. So now you're getting ten thousand a year in cash flow on an eighty-eight thousand dollar investment. That's an 11.6% rate of return on your money that you've got invested. And then what was the buyout amount changing to? So I think I changed that from 75,000 to 85,000. I don't know if I apparently just randomly put in a number here. So let, let's say it's 85,000. So 10,000. Because you took it from 75 to 80, remember? Yeah, I'm taking it 75 to 80, but now I am, instead of getting a 10% rate of return while it is occupied, mm -hmm. I'm getting an 8% return while it is occupied, which means realistically, if you bought it out after a year, it would be 6%. Okay. 6% cash on cash. I almost sort of kind of feel like you would be dumb to refinance this. Your rate of return is actually higher under this scenario by not refinancing it than it is by refinancing it. But that means your $88,000 is stuck in the property. Yeah. And so then I'm probably going to run into an awesome deal. You probably are. <laughs> <laughs> so... You see the you see the problem here, right? It's um like the cath the cash on cash return and having a fixed payment is amazing. You are still you are still only half owner, so someday when you go to sell it, you're going to owe me half of the equity, right? Half of the because mm -hmm. if if you're not buying it out in the first year, then we're just we're just riding. We're, we're just, just we're just partners. <laughs> yeah. So if it if it if it is worth half a million dollars in 20 years and you're like, yeah, we should sell it. I'm getting 250 and you're getting 250. I'm but going through this with two properties right now. I have two properties that I owe 120 or less on that are worth over $320,000, but it's not worth refinancing because I have 3% locked in rates, three and yep. four, and yep. now double rates. And I'm like, Dang, you know, it's <laughs> mm -hmm. just messed up. Mm -hmm. My payments are so low. I mean, no one's, I have a five bedroom house with a jacuzzi and a cul-de-sac for less than $850 a month, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's like nobody, it's unheard of. 
Yeah. So in theory, if you do refinance it, um, now you are in it for $8,400. And now you will not have enough money from the refi to completely pay me off. You're actually going to have to have another $5,000 to pay me off. Because remember, we incre- it, it came out dead even. Okay, so I would have to pay you five thousand out of my purchase original purchase amount. Well, I, right. So you got the you've got the refi money coming in of one sixty eight. You need eighty eight to pay yourself back, and now you need eighty five to pay me back. So I would get eighty two plus the and, and just have to deal with the cash flow from that point forward. Yeah, but you don't. You still won't have a ton of money invested in this. Mm-hmm. You'll bring 5000 to the closing because the loan proceeds won't cover my buyout, my full buyout, and you'll bring 8400 for closing costs. So thirteen four, and you'll have cash flow of 8400 That's a really good cash on cash return. Cash flow of 8400 a year. Okay. Is that, is that right? 19? So let me ask you a question. If this cash flow is incorrect. If. We agreed to me paying the, doing the sublease of a thousand dollars or the master lease, I mean, and somehow I was able to squeeze $1,400 a month per property. Mm -hmm. How would that affect the, the, the relationship? Like, would that matter? Does that matter in this kind of business or. I, if, if I am looking at this deal, I'm looking at it based on what I on the numbers that I think are going to happen. If in a master lease situation, if you happen to get more money, that's fine. That's yours. Because if I'm not, if I'm not happy with the 500 a month, then I'm just not going to do the deal. If I'm happy with 500 a month, I shouldn't be going, well, I want to get 600 a month because she's making more. This is the, this is the opposite conversation we just had. I should not be looking at it like, well, she ripped me off because that 500 I was happy with, I'm not happy with it anymore because she's making more. Uh, who, okay. ca- who cares? I mean, if I've always more? been curious about stuff like that, you know? Yeah, no. In a, in, I've in never a, wanted to burn bridges with anybody in this type of thing. And I may be able to squeeze something yeah. out of something, you know, even if it's temporary or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um or we're, I might go under, or it might not be as much, and I still have to pay my thousand. So it's like, well, we're talking about this like, like the refi basically happens at a year. Mm-hmm. It, that's probably not how the documents would be written, because I don't like putting balloons into people's lives that they have to meet. Mm-hmm. So the master lease would be for however long you, you know, forever effectively. But usually when it's a very long-term master lease like that, there is an acceleration built into that monthly payment. Mm -hmm. So the payments a thousand a month, the first year, and then it's going to go up 3% a year or something like that. Okay. I understand that. So, yeah. So that the rate of return does in fact increase. Okay. So this is, this is kind of, a twist on the first one that puts more of the cash flow into your column and less of it into my column, but puts more of the equity on sale into my column and less into your column. So that was why the question came up. What do you like better cash flow or equity? And again, this is a snapshot. If this master lease went on for the next 10 years, it, it sort of changes these back end numbers to where you, you, you're, you're, your buyout is just 50% of whatever the property is worth at the time of the, of the buyout or sale. Okay. But you can't, you know, now we don't need a spreadsheet. We need a logic tree. So I just try to make them as simple as possible. Now the okay. third offer was actually, I guess this was the second offer time-wise um, was probably more along the lines of what you expected to hear. Cause what, what most people expect when they ask for money to do a deal is a loan. Mm-hmm. And Darren offered a loan. And this is not my my feel is that this is not a Darren's uh hard money program loan. It is just Darren investing his own 
uh, probably IRA money would be my guess. So his loan was, and he said, let me just simplify this for you, Lenora. <laughs> Cause we had just spent like 30 minutes talking these other things through. He said, I will loan you. I will loan you the $75,000 you need. You pay me back 80,000. You will pay me back 80, then- which, which is a way of saying there's, $5,000 in points that mm-hmm. are rolled into the loan and you will pay interest on those, but you don't actually have to pay them up front. You don't have to like, give me $5,000 to get this loan. I'll just add it to the loan. So then the payments would be interest only at 800 a month. And he said he would do that for as long as you wanted, no balloon. It didn't take even a financial calculator to figure out that's a 12% simple interest loan. If you owe 80,000 and you're paying 800 a month, that's 1% a month, that's 12% a year. Mm -hmm. So now, this did not come over from the other sheet because I copied it. And if anybody's like, if anybody's watching this and being like, why didn't she just get this right to start with? Why does she have to keep fixing this? The answer is, Shut up. It's free. Neither Lenora or I actually had to do this tonight. (laughs) (laughs) So this is a, this is an interesting offer because now you've got your $2,200 a month gross. This is the revised thing we did with the maintenance, et cetera. uh, $118 a month in taxes, 120 in, in estimated insurance. Payment to Darren is eight hundred a month. That is a six hundred eleven dollars a month cash flow. That is higher cash flow than you have seen on any of these offers, uh, other than what was the cash flow on this one? But that wouldn't be for four months. Right, right. So you could negotiate or you could try to counter Darren with, I will do this, but I don't want to make any payment or have any interest for the first month. And then if it if I don't have at least one tenant in at the end of the month, I want to add the $800 to the loan instead of making the payment. Or you could just make the payment. Yeah, just make the payment. I guess so- So if you refi the property at the end of the year, which you probably, probably should do that. I I would do six months. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Well, well, you won't, you, you probably won't be able to take cash out in six months is the only, is the only thing, because if it's a Fannie Mae loan, it's usually a year to get a cash out refi. Fannie Mae, Fannie Mae. Conventional. A conventional oh, okay. bank loan. Gotcha. Now you you might you're probably not using conventional money. You're probably using what I call Wall Street money. Okay. Which is it's still a loan on real estate. It's a higher cost loan. I would use the higher cost on this because my dream house would you know my DTI would be messed up for my dream house. Okay, so you're going to get it like a like a no doc loan, which which actually is probably going to raise your rate, and it's definitely going to raise your upfront cost because there's always like multiple points on those loans. A, a conventional loan is often a point and a half. And I it don't think I've ever seen 2.5. Yeah. I don't think I've ever seen one of those Wall Street loans that is um it's 2.5. Yeah. So I don't actually think you're going to need any excess money to pay off Darren. Nope. That works out. If you get a 168 refi that pays off Darren, it gets you your money back and it's exactly even again. Like you get exactly enough money to pay off Darren and get your money back, but you are, you do still have this total cash invested. Now, when I send you this spreadsheet, you're going to want to change this total cash invested on the front page to whatever you think the real costs are going to be. Cause I only had it in at 5%. It might be more like six or 7% if you're getting a different kind of loan. Seven. So after the, um, after the refi, your cash flow 
I don't know what happened here. Becomes. This 119 11 a month times 12 months a year over your $8,400 investment is 17%. So the, the after refi cash flow is about the same as the very first scenario we looked at. And you get the money you need to keep the property and you own a hundred percent of the property. You just have a lien against it. Instead of giving it part of the ownership, you know what your payment is every month. It's 800. It's not half of whatever the rent is. Darren of course is putting in 75,000 getting a lien against the property. He does not, he does not get any equity in this scenario. <clears throat> Uh, he gets eight hundred dollars a month in cash flow unless you negotiate something else, and his he's getting a he's getting an overall rate of return of twelve point eight percent when you count in the points. Okay, so he gets at the end of the loan he gives up the lien against the property, but he gets five thousand dollars plus his seventy five, and he gets a financial friendship relationship with Lenora. And I, the reason I keep mentioning these things, the financial friendships is because most people, if the deal goes well, that, that is not the first deal. That's not the last deal that they do. They end up doing deals over and over and over again. And sometimes when the, when that financial friends relationship matures enough, it becomes, okay, in this case, you need alone at 5% because nothing else will work. You know, I don't give loans at 5%. I could almost, I could just like buy a 30 year treasury bond at this point and get 5%. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't give loans at 5%, but I'm going to give this one to you for six months because we've done so much business together. And because I know you are going to do the same for me someday, there will be some time when I need money wired to me right this second to close up some deal and you're like, don't even, you don't even have to That's tell me about it. Me. Tell me where to, tell me where to wire it. I know it'll be. Those okay. are the relationships that I, I have built um, so far. And it's so funny because when I first asked for money, because I didn't have any way to prove myself, mm -hmm. I was getting a no. And then I started doing more, you know, rehabs and things. And then she was like, I'll, you know, I have 15,000 I can give you. And mm -hmm. then, um, you know, I gave her 15 back in less than half the time I agreed to, because that's what I do. I like double, triple the time. Um, and then the next borrow was 60. Mm -hmm. So, and it was like, you know, so it's just like a constant ongoing. And then she needed to borrow 10 from the 60, <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, so I, I've said this from the front of the room many times, but, but now you have you have said it right you've proved it the key to building these relationships is show up so people at least know who you are try mm -hmm. to help people how you can it's not always especially not at the beginning it's not it's not usually money and it may not be deals it may be hey i know how you can get a, a appliance for a you know, great refrigerator for 80 bucks um so that yeah you know, cuz there's a there's the law of reciprocity right people want to help people who help them Mm -hmm. And then the third piece is do what you say you're going to do. That's, and, should, that's almost the first, that's the first piece for real. <laughs> yes. And, <laughs> and, and if you can't do it, I mean, we all run across stuff, you know, like I, I, I had to go get an operation and I was out for six weeks and I could not do whatever I said I was going to do for you it, or, or, you know, 2007 happens. I had to call a couple of private lenders in 2007 and said, uh, said, Hey, okay, look, I borrowed this money from you in 06. I said, I was going to pay it back in 07. There's an issue. Are you aware what it is? <laughs> the property will not appraise for enough money for me to pay you back. So what would you like to do? We can keep going on the loan. I can make the payments. That's not a problem. And, and you invested at a pretty decent rate of interest. So I can keep making the payments. That would be thing number one. Thing number two is it's fair for you to say, I want the house. I'm not going to make you go through a foreclosure. 
if if you need if you need the money and you need to get the money by selling the house or right, I'll give you the house, but it's probably not going to sell for. I only borrowed seventy percent of what it was worth, but now it's worth fifty percent of what it was worth. So that's you might want to keep taking these papers. <laughs> you yeah. might want to keep you want you might want to keep taking the money, but if you if you want to own the house and get the rents from it or whatever, I'm you know I can't do what I said I was going to do, and so here's how I'm going to try to fix it for you. And hundred percent of the time, they just extended the loan because the other thing was they didn't feel great about. All right, if I get the money back, I still want to go get my eight percent return on it, and I don't know where to loan it out to get that eight percent return in this market. Not because I don't think people will pay it, but because I don't know. I don't know what to value properties at right now. Mm-hmm. It, it's it's it, they're, they're doing nothing but going down. So, if if something does go wrong. Do not go dark. Explain what's happening. Give options. Fix it, right? That's, so that's just like with student loans. People don't, you know, every time I hear somebody that says, oh, my student loan was in default and that's why my credit is bad. And I think, so, and I tell them, I say, it's because you didn't call them. The student, <laughs> FAFSA and student loans and the numbers that I've called, you call them and they just instantly put you on deferment for a year. Mm. Instantly. Any excuse you have, you can just anything. Yep. And it's like, you're not even reaching out to these people. You're like, oh, I'm just going to avoid it. Like, it's not going to do anything mm-hmm. to you when you could have just helped yourself. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep. Um, just it's always a bad idea to hide your head when you can't keep one of your commitments. And if you're if you're listening to this and you're going, well, the problem is I wouldn't have known to say to the lender, you can have the house back or I can keep making the payments or whatever. That's where you reach back into your community and you find somebody who's not all involved in the situation like you are, who's hopefully got some experience and say, here's here's the problem I'm having. Give me options. Because sometimes you get all up in your, because it's like, you're like, oh my God, I can't pay my private lender. Like I said, I was going to, my life's over, my reputation's ruined. And you can't think logically about what else could happen, but somebody else can think logically about it and can often come up with solutions that are much better than anything you've thought of. But you can't be all like, I don't want to tell anybody about this. You know, go to somebody you trust, say, this is confidential. I don't, I don't want to I don't want this discussed with anybody else, but here's my problem. What do I do about it? I, I work with somebody at RIA with, uh, about that around 2010, 2011. So at the end of the whole thing, and it was the same deal. He borrowed money from a friend and it was a lot of money. It was like $188,000. He put the property up on the market. It would not sell for $188,000. Uh, he could rent it for like $3,000 a month, but it just was not selling. And he said, I don't want to tell my friend I can't give him his 188 and I don't have the money to make up the difference. I could sell it for 170, but I don't have 18,000 to give him. So what do I do? And I said, you need to go to your friend and you need to say, I can get $3,000 a month rent for this house. What I would suggest is we turn our loan into a partnership. I will transfer 50% of the property to you. And that means that you will be getting right now $1,500 a month in gross rent. And then later on, as the value goes up and the Rents go up, you'll be getting more and more and more. And he went to the friend and said that. And the friend said, that sounds great. Oh, and you'll get depreciation now, which you didn't get before and mm-hmm. which you could use because you're high income. And the friend was like, that sounds great. And that was what they did. You never know what somebody's going to, you, you might look at it and go, oh, they're not going to do that. But then they do. So the fourth offer <laughs> was kind of... Um, I feel like Pete was kind of putting this out here just to show an example of another way to do this deal. And I think you you kind of looked at it and went, uh, why would I do that? So basically what Pete said, Pete heard Darren's offer and he said, well, I could increase her cash flow by $50 a month by making it so that she only had to pay $750 a month instead of $800 a month to Darren. And the way to do that would be pay the points up front. So what he offered you was $5,000 to pay those points for, to Darren up front, but what he wanted in return <laughs> was an option to buy the property, to buy half the property. He didn't want to buy the whole property. He said, I, I want an option to buy half the property at 37.5. 30, 
Yes. Oh, which God. really means, which really means 32, five, because he already gave you five of it. Mm -hmm. So 32, five sometime off in the future. And that was sort of, of, uh, you know, cussed and discussed and all that sort of stuff. And you sort of went, uh, yeah, I don't really quite see the benefit of getting an extra 50 bucks a month in cash flow, but giving up a whole lot of equity. I mean, he can buy, he can buy half of what's right now, he could buy $120,000 in equity for 325. Yeah. So the modification that we, we talked about, but I still don't think it was acceptable to you was he can't exercise the option for 20 years. He wanted the option for 20 years, but we said, well, you know, you could make it so he can't actually give you 32.5 and take half your property for 20 years because we know that what Pete is doing is building wealth for his grandkids. He doesn't, mm -hmm. he doesn't expect to be alive in 20 years. He expects to have his grandkids be able to come to you and say, I would like to give you 32.5 for half ownership in this house. I think you felt like 5,000 upfront was not enough to create a situation where it's not your grandkids that are getting half the property. It's his grandkids that are getting half the property. The, ben the only benefit is it would lower your pay payment, Darren, by $50 a month. So you'd get, you'd get 50 extra dollars a month in cash flow. That's 600 extra years, multiply or 600 extra a year. Assume rent, rent will never grow up more than inflation and multiply that by 20 years. You received an extra six hundred times twenty years. You received an extra twelve thousand dollars in rent, but you gave up <laughs> probably hundreds of thousands at that point. I was about to say I'm not good at math, but um, <laughs> you know my quick little crappy calculations is just not that uh, wouldn't be it yeah so the the i need to go to the pawn shop the interesting thing the interesting thing about this and any pete wasn't trying to be greedy i think he was trying to actually just put another thing out there on the table i feel like he was trying to open up our minds to the he fact was. that there's so much there's so many creative ways that you can think about things that you really don't think about and somebody else could be in that situation where that made sense to them, mm -hmm. you know, and that was an agreement that they came to consciously. Well, and Pete does not realize how intimidating he is. He he thinks, he thinks, you know, if she doesn't like, she should make me a counter offer. And it's like, oh, you're like the, you're like the accepted real estate creative genius of the world. <laughs> and yeah, I'm going to try and counter your creative offer with one of my own. I, I, I don't think so, but it might have been interesting to go back to him with some offer like, okay, I'll tell you what, give me $88,000 and I will give you the right to buy half the house in 20 years. I was thinking like 55. 55,000. He probably yeah, would have gone was for like, that. I was thinking about like how to like say something about that, but I wasn't thinking 88. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, that would get you all your money back. Yeah, I was well, I was thinking 55 will be good enough for me to add the difference, fix the house, gain whatever monies I get for 20 years, and then mm -hmm. not really worry about one of the things that Pete really likes, and I only know this from having gone back and forth on creative offers with him myself, is he really likes remainder interests in life estates, mm -hmm. which is you die. I know his kids get the property the house. No, nah, I don't even like the, I don't even like the sound of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, he would have, he probably would have given you every dime you were looking for to get a life estate on the property. No, and then I would have died next week. On accident. What, that, <laughs> what that, what that complicates is um, so what this offer complicates is if you wanted to sell the property or refinance it before he exercised his option, a whole bunch of paperwork has to happen to release the option, put it back, move it to another property, do something. And that's just a lot of. And he wouldn't. And like he said, he wouldn't agree to that. Well, no, he, he would agree to, to he, what he said was I will release my option for the refi and put it back. Cause he, he, he seems to think that lenders will subordinate 
but we'll allow him to subordinate. So in other words, like you get the new loan and he leaves his option in place, but just says, I'm moving my option to behind your loan. Yeah, just move it they over. Won't, yeah, no. They won't do that. I, I, I They can't even understand it. So <laughs> it has to be released for the refi. And then the way I've always handled that is, yeah, I'm going to release it, but I already have a new one that you've signed sitting here ready to record as soon as the mortgage is recorded. But what he said was, if he said, I would be willing to let you refinance it, but then I would want my option to be to buy it subject to that loan, to buy half of it subject to that loan. So that was just just a little twist. But that one, you you just didn't see the benefit of getting $5,000 and lowering your payment by 50 bucks a month. Pete's last offer got super complicated. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he has a waterfront property in Florida that a lot of us on the haves and wants call are familiar with because he's offered it up in various deals. That property is worth about $740,000. It is a rental property. It rents, it's got actually two units. It rents for, last time I looked, he was getting $2,900 a month between the two units. I think that's under market, but he's got leases. So you're stuck with that for a little while. Uh, it is literally on a canal. The insurance is very high because you got to have hurricane flood, all that kind of stuff. It being right on the canal. It cannot be Airbnb because of the location, uh, but it is a very nice property. It's not, I, I've also seen pictures of the inside and I will tell you, it is not rehabbed to the numerous standards. <laughs> you would, you would look at the inside and go, oh my God, we got to start all over here. Cause it's, it's a 1950s property. Bathroom is still 1950s. Kitchen is still 1950s. So I have no doubt he could put it on the market and sell it for 740 as is, but you'd be putting another $100,000 into it because you just can't tolerate a house that isn't in really nice shape. That's my brain. <laughs> so he, <laughs> he, what he wanted to do was give you that property in return for this duplex you already own and also 500,000 cash. So effectively he was using your duplex as a down payment on the 740. You're saying your duplex is worth 240? Give it to me, that'll be the down payment. You'll still owe me 500,000 cash. Now, to be clear, he doesn't care where you get that cash. If you wanted to finance that property as long as it ended up being cash to him, he'd be cool with that. And then in order for you to keep control of the duplex, he was he would lease it back to you. So you could still get some of the cash flow from the duplex. You wouldn't own it unless you bought it back from him at some point, but you would have you would have the control of your duplex. You could get the cash flow over whatever his lease amount was. You would, in theory, if you came up with half a million dollars, have a waterfront property in Florida. This one just didn't go anywhere. It kind of went wah, wah. When he said $500,000 cash because you were like, I'm, yeah. I'm trying to get $75,000 cash and you're <laughs> asking me for $500,000 cash. Had we had more time to explore this because again, this was not the only <laughs> deal we were working with during that time. We had a, this this deal actually happened I don't, I don't think anybody knows that because she was thinking about it, but we're, we're actually in the process of making this okay. go. Yep. This one might happen. We're arguing over which property she wants to secure this wrap on. This one happened. This one happened. So it was all very busy. Catherine got her deal funded. It was, it was a busy day. If we had had time to consider this one further and you were interested in Florida properties. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you are or not. I know a lot of a lot of our members here in Ohio have this I want to move down to that area when I retire kind of goal. <clears throat> I love Nevada. So dry heat, not wet heat. I love dry <laughs> heat. It just okay. does wonders for my hair. It so, lets me keep it in the style. <laughs> so um an interesting thing to explore on this would have been you don't have $500,000 cash and you don't want the property, but who does? 
who could give Pete his 500,000 and somehow work it around so that you got, so maybe Pete does get your duplex, but you get to lease it back and they provide the money to do the repairs. And we could have gotten like a third and fourth person involved in this deal if we had had more time and somebody had gone, oh my God, I need that property in Florida. There, 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 there could have been a way that Pete could get his cash because he said what he wanted the cash for. He had an opportunity to get something else that he liked better. Mm-hmm. He could get his cash. You could get your money. You could get your duplex. But we just didn't have have time at that point to to dig into that. But that's 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 one of the reasons to attend the prop swap meetings and one of the reasons <clears throat> to ask questions in it because had that had that deal come together. Uh, it would have been really interesting and really confusing. You almost, you almost have to draw a picture of who's involved and what each person is getting. But that one that one just didn't go anywhere because Lenore was like, uh, don't have half a million, don't want a property in Florida. So I'm going to have to pass on that one, which is fine. You're allowed to say, no, that one just doesn't, doesn't interest me and let other people try and jump in and make it interest you by providing you with what you actually want instead of what Pete offered you. Nope. I liked, I liked being, um, having those ideas put in my head because when I talk to other people, when I, now, when I speak to them and I'm like, well, why didn't you think about it this way? And like, and they're in awe and I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> I didn't come up with this on my own, <laughs> you know, <laughs> other people have opened my mind to this. It's been pretty awesome. Cause now everybody's looking up at me, like she's the queen of the, da da and I'm like, <laughs> Sure. <laughs> I've just learned this over the last four years. That's that's how everybody learns it is they see other people do stuff. And mm-hmm. at first it's really confusing. And then after a while they go, oh, you know, I could have applied that to this deal I did before. And then they actually do apply it to the next deal. And then after after a while and after you've done some things that you basically just saw someone else do, you're you start to be able to say, wait, I can take a little piece of that one thing and combine it with a little piece of that other thing and then make a new deal I've never actually seen before, but that works really well. I actually became a member because of my late cousin, um, Cam, Cam, I don't know what he named himself. His name is Taifa, but uh, (laughs) Cam Kali. um, Mm -hmm. And he told me, he said, cuz, you know what kind of deal you just did? You did a sub two deal. And I was like, no, I just <laughs> took over her mortgage. <laughs> I was like, I paid her back foreclosure costs and took over her mortgage. I didn't do no sub two, you know, That's and literally funny. he was like, man, you got to read this lady named Venus. You know, I got all these documents or I think it may have been CDs or something. Probably. He was like, it was a while back. Yes, it was a while. <laughs> and from that point on, he kept telling me I need to go to the groups, you know, and and then that's when I went because I was like, I did not do a sub two. I mean, I argued till I was blue in the face. I'm like, I didn't do a deal. I just did this because <laughs> mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I didn't understand it. I couldn't wrap my head around it. I still okay. have that. House to this so, day. so are you clearer on the three options that you might actually consider here? I am very much so clearer. Okay. Um, I I would say that given your ultimate desire to own a hundred percent of the property and keep it forever. It, it kind of looks like Darren's offer was the one that makes the most sense. It's simplest. It gets you the highest rate of return mm-hmm. now. And later, the only one that this one gets you a higher rate of return, but you're giving up half your equity. Mm-hmm. And on in this one, you're not giving up any equity. So if I were looking at like, if, if this were my deal, I would probably do the partnership just because I like having people plant their money in my properties forever and I don't ever have to pay them back. But I, my feel is that your kind of preferences about how you own things and whatnot would lead you to this one. I but- think it's leading me to that one because more than anything, because the other deal, it's not allowing me to get my money back either. Right. Well, this like one time soon. Yeah, this one only allows you to get your money back if you refi it. 
And yes, it has to be, it cannot be unless in less can, than a year. It, it, wait, let me, let me say that differently. It can't be in less than a year. If you're going to take me out of the deal, if you leave me okay. in the deal, it can be in three months. I just, I can borrow money against a property that I exchanged into. I just can't sell it for a okay. year. Okay. 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 So that's different. <laughs> Yeah. Because I wasn't saying take you out of the deal. I was saying, I just need my money back. <laughs> yeah. T- t- yeah. T- t- the, the, the only reason I need a, an increased buyout and I need it to not happen for a year is if the 1031 you take it out. Yeah. If you, if there's no option to buy, so let's eliminate this. If we said there's not an option to buy it, there's not an option for you to buy your half back or the option isn't exercisable for 10 years or, you know, something like that, that changes all of this stuff. It changes the increased buyout. It changes everything because I don't have to go searching for another property and I don't get kicked out of the deal. (laughs) Okay. If I, if I find a deal, I like, I'm not excited about getting kicked out of it. So I want to be paid to get kicked out of it. So there's there's other there's other variations on this one that we could look at. This is this is this is a fairly simple like the payment is just this much. I know I there's no what happened with the reserves, blah blah blah. It's just simply you're the master tenant, you pay a thousand dollars a month at the beginning, and then we probably accelerate it a little bit over time. Mm-hmm. That is a very simple deal for me. And if you're not gonna, if you're not gonna kick me out <laughs> by um, refinancing it, then I don't need an extra buyout. Now the the complication there is a refi create to get your money out, and it, and my money would come out at the same time. My cash would come out at the same time. Does create a payment that you cannot also pay an additional master lease fee. You know what I'm saying? You can't, you can't, yeah. you can't pay. So I will pay 500 on top of the payment, but you can't, the cash was not there for that. Okay. Got it's you. not possible. So if I had all my money back because it had been refied, do I care whether there's any master lease fee anymore? I'll have to think about that. If it, So what I'm saying is. I get what you're saying, because now you got all your money back. Your return came, your return of your funds came quicker than, uh, mm-hmm. way quicker than you, you could put that toward, toward, damn, and you still get your 1031 exchange rocking. Yeah, that's pretty, <laughs> that would kind of just. Yeah, no, it, both free in, in the areas that we want to be free in. And I would I would still have half the equity, which I would never see. I mean, I wouldn't see that for decades, probably. Mm-hmm. But if I have no money invested in it, am I okay with seeing it decades from now? Now I have no grandchildren, but <laughs> would, would I be would I be okay with that? Maybe. I mean, it, it would probably have to be. We'd have to we'd have to think about it and hammer it out because it would probably be like okay for the first five years there's no lease fee but then it should be you know there should be a hundred dollars a month or something there should be something coming in eventually yeah yeah, yeah so I'd have to I'd have to think about I'd have to think about that the equity or something yeah I, I'd have to think about that and so would you so okay. what I thought was going to be maybe a forty five minute Let's just go through this has become, you know, an hour and a half of let's go through this. Maybe I'll see if I can get through to edit, edit That's down some. Sewer. Am I tripping? But I think, uh, I think this is going to be, if, for the people who bother to watch it, I think it's going to be really educational. So I, I appreciate you being willing to let it be recorded and distributed to your colleagues. No, I I think I learned a lot today because I feel totally different about (laughs) my purchase. I'm like, oh my God, are this the numbers? (laughs) Okay. So I will send you the spreadsheet so that as you, 
if you want to mess around with what is the real cost of the refi going to be, do it, you know, what if it's a 10%, how do these things work at 10%? You can just change the front page. And now I think I've got it fixed. So all the other pages will change. So I do have a quick question to ask you. Do you think I, I purchased a good deal or is this not a good deal? When did you buy it? I just bought it. When did you put it under contract? When? Yeah. When did you initially agree to buy it? Um, Like three weeks prior to closing, which was less than, I will say three weeks ago or a month. So. Yes, but let me say yes, but I think it was a good buy because you like it. You want to make a long-term investment in the neighborhood and really it doesn't matter what you pay for a property if you're going to hold on to it forever and you get good financing on it. So the, the if wild I wanted- card, the okay. wild card is the increasing interest rates. Yeah. And, and a lot, a lot of us haven't quite caught up with how does the birth strategy work when interest rates seem to just be going up and up and up and up and up with no end in sight. And your instinct about this is a good purchase because I know my payment's going to be about this. You cannot trust it anymore. You have to get out a spreadsheet and say, what is the payment at the new interest rates? So I, I don't think you're going to be unhappy with it. I think it's possible that, you know, next year it's only worth 220, but then the year after that'll be worth 250. It, it that that matters so much less when you're going to hold on to it for a long time. But going forward, whenever you're looking at one of these rentals, run that spreadsheet about what's what do I think rates are going to be by the time I'm ready to refinance. And now what what was your rate that you were supposed to be getting? Um uh before the financing fell through. Oh, it was crap. It was 11. Oh, for, you know, cause it was a bridge loan. So you would have had to take that out. Yeah. Okay. So the, the cal- the end calculation would not have changed, Yeah. but they were supposed to give you a bunch of the money for the, they were going to give repairs. me, um, yes, they were going to give me 60 towards the repairs. Cause I was paying 20 some thousand down, you know? Mm-hmm. So Yeah. Yeah. Well, you should, you should have, I mean, I thought you, I know you thought you had all the money handled, it fell apart, whatever. You should have done this calculation about when I take the loan out, what does my cash flow look like? And I, I wouldn't be shocked if a year from now, conventional rates for investors were at nine, nine and a half. Um, I predicted at the beginning of this year that uh, interest rates for homeowners were going to be we're we're going to end the year at close to seven, and we're at six point seven one right now. Mm-hmm. And investor rates are always a point point and a half higher than that. Yeah. Yeah, I think I um like part of me had thought that maybe I should have just left the deal alone, but then the other part of me is like, I mean, it is a three bedroom and it will rent out, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but it does need some work. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm going to get back to these floors. <laughs> All right. I hate these um, floors now. <laughs> if you, if you, if you are watching, hopefully we'll see you at an upcoming Cincinnati RIA co members only Friday morning haves and wants slash prop swap. Maybe you can get some problems solved too. Absolutely. I'll be there too. <laughs> See y'all later.